most of you know me. Some of you wished you didn't probably, and the rest of you will in a minute. But Rusty and I were cousins, and uh, we grew up together out in Owens, and it was more like brothers than cousins, because he was four years older than me, and uh, there wasn't anybody else to play with, so we had no choice but associating with each other, you know, because we spent a lot of time at our grandma's house uh, with, with her and, and when our parents were working or whatever they were doing. Uh, I look at this hat, and, and every day on about family, you know, we'll want about like that, or, or save money till they could get one. But, uh, so I, I appreciate that. I, I, I want to go back to some of these other stories, David and the music and the, uh, it's kind of interesting because I always looked up to Rusty and Rusty was really, uh, uh, pretty knowledgeable about things and things he wasn't knowledgeable about, he could figure out anyhow enough to talk you into doing something. And, uh, that goes on. Is Hugh Martin here by any chance? That's another name. Yes, he is. Okay. Well, Hugh, you're in part of this story. Because it's you and Rusty that taught me into climbing a seedling grapefruit tree and jumping out of it with a four-cornered red handkerchief. <laughs> and, and you told me that it was like a parachute. <laughs> well, a seedling orange tree, those of you who haven't been around one, some of them aren't around now, they're about 30, 40 feet tall. And if the ground hadn't been dissed, I'd be disabled today. <laughs> but but there was always something like that going on. And since Hugh is, we're blessed to have Hugh here today. So I'll, I'll hurry up and get the one other thing that's in my mind. I, I was trying to decide whether or not to share. But uh, Rusty and Hugh did a lot of stuff. And there's an old cowboy named Bill Dick Ford. And Bill Dick Ford... Uh, knew a lot. Bill Dick Ford, did anybody ever heard of Squash Ford that made a lot of moonshine uh, out in uh, up in the bunker, wherever, out up in that area of the county? Uh, that's right. So Bill Dick was his younger brother or one of his brothers, and he wasn't quite into the moonshine thing, but he knew how to make home brew with chicken feed. And uh, so we had a bottle it in a cap it up. We, I, I was just kind of there doing the labor. But you and Rusty and Marshall Whitten and, and Hal Lewis and uh, uh, a few others had a bottle it in a cap it operation in one of the old barns there down there behind Rusty's house. And what is interesting, and I know Hugh, will, Hugh is, this is coming immediately, is that they, they sometimes get in a hurry with their captain. And they bottled up a bunch and capped it early. And if you cap brew before it's through brewing, it's a high probability it's going to blow the caps off. So Hugh came home from school one day, and his mother was, I think, in his room or somewhere very perturbed because Hugh had taken his six, we put it in Pepsi bottles, he took his six bottles to the house and put it in the closet, and all the caps blew off. So I don't know what odorless dry cleaners charge to get all that stuff cleaned, washed, and straightened up, but I remember that story. And every time I, every time Rusty and I would get together, we'd get into these stories like that. And uh, it was just, it was just wonderful. He would, uh, you know, Rusty rode an old horse named Honey, and that belonged to the Smiths. That we were kind of kin to the Smiths through Dan Garner and the other uh, Dorothy Garner. And, well, Rusty rode honey when we go to cow camp. If y'all know where the cow camp was, some of you probably do and don't, but where the Peachland Publix is, we had a set of cow pens and a camp shack there. And a couple times a year, Pete Lanier is sitting over there, a couple times a year we'd go to cow camp. And Rusty unsaddled his horse one day and put the saddle too near the horse. And honey ate the back out of the saddle or put some pretty serious tooth marks. Well, the reason I know that and remember that, and it's a very special piece of equipment to me now, one of my grand young uns the other day was saying, Grandpa, this saddle feels funny in our feed room right down there at my place right now. And I went over and looked, and that saddle had a three or four mouths full of leather scraped out of it, and it's that same old saddle at Rusty Road. Rusty Road with honey. I was his audience. So when he bought his harmonica, I got to listen to him 
because there wasn't anybody else. And if everybody else had a car, he could go work or something. He played to me. And uh, so I listened to all of that. I went through all his harmonicas with him. He finally got two or three deep mad buttons on the end of you could push and make it do different things. But always, always a one. And, and now I realize in hindsight what a wonderful, what a wonderful time it was. He got his guitar, same deal. Hang down your head, Tom Dooley. I've heard that song sung. I know the words to that one. And the other one was the old lamp lighter. And he hated it for me to do that because I could never get that one he made tonight a little lighter and it's kind of an off half beat something. And I was always on the wrong side of the tune and he never could get me to do that thing right. He loved Ricky Nelson and he loved the Everly Brothers. And he, that, that was too, uh, along with the Kingston Trio, was a lot of the, a lot of the music that he, uh, he emulated. And to my knowledge, his, all his life, he could never read a note of music. But he really was just skilled and natural at music that he could sit down at the piano. You could give him almost anything probably and let him mess with it a little bit and he could play music. And, uh, and so I've, I watched all of that and watched it. And then I got to tag along when all the, all the guys were doing. I mean, Johnny Carlson, Carl Carlson, uh, Chuck Martin, uh, I can't think, just everybody there in town, they all, they all were musicians together and had some... Uh, some some really wonderful times, and I got to witness, got to witness a whole lot of that. Uh, I got a whole bunch of things. Some of them got away from here. Uh, Saturday mornings, Annie Laurie made the best waffles I've ever eaten until this day. Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's another cousin right over there. And uh, I used to be up there every Saturday morning almost. And, and she would do waffles, put butter on them, and she, the thing was it was a little bit of an offbeat to the family because she didn't use cane syrup that had been made somewhere. She used K-Row, mm -hmm. which is really, today, you know, that's not, I wouldn't eat K-Row, but that K-Row syrup was special, so we ate that K-Row But they were wonderful waffles, and, and if you're old enough or of the right iteration, Jimmy, <laughs> but uh, then we'd listen to a radio show and drink Pepsi Cola. And it was Big John and Little Spark. Anybody remember that? It was a radio show every Saturday morning. And, uh, and Rusty had just been, he was always using me, you know, either teaching me something, telling me something, or, or helping convince me to do something like jump out of the grapefruit tree. <laughs> and, uh, uh, actually, the one thing, and he and I remembered this every time we've been together since over the last few years even, was the, the, buckets, the bucket and the rocks. But we had a little old, bench kind of thing in a barn down there in my house. And uh, Daddy, thank goodness it was Daddy's bucket from the military when they still made things good, but had a bucket with a real, thank goodness, had a real strong bail on it. It was Daddy's Marine Corps bucket. Then. I guess they washed your clothes, brushed your teeth, and did everything else in that bucket you know, in that World War II, late 30s on era. Uh, but we'd take that bucket and we had some rocks everybody brought you every time we went to North Carolina or somewhere you brought some rocks back you know <laughs> so we always had rocks laying around somewhere that I could identify where every one of them came from and uh, we'd fill that bucket with rocks tie a rope on it throw a rope over the rafter in the barn we'd drop the bucket down till it, we'd have one of us that lay there and look and we'd drop the bucket down and it was about like that and then you'd tie it off so I know the Lord was with us. Because <laughs> we'd tie that thing off, then we'd take turns getting under it and drop it, that bucket would come <laughs> <laughs> stop. Six inches from your face. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I probably did it first because he wanted to be sure he didn't want you know, he, he didn't want the designer to be harmed, so he tried to but we did that a thousand times. But those little green frogs, we got about a thousand of them pulling their legs off one time. <laughs> Took them to Mama because we wanted to have frog legs. You know what? That barn smelled funny to this day if Char Hurricane Charlie blew it away. Uh, we'd go on Sunday rides. And he had that 62 Chevrolet. He first got the first cool car. And then he had to end up with a couple of Corvettes. But the 62 Chevrolet. We'd go to Venice. Sarasota, Bradenton, and come home. 
get a milkshake or something, you know, and make up some kind of a story. We'd go to Fort Winder if I ended up involved in Fort Winder some too. But the Fort Winder School, I remember going in there one day, walked all over the old Fort Winder School before it was going away. We'd go to all the old bridges, the Fort Winder, Fort Ogden River Bridge. It had been shut down and not allowed, but it was one of those old steel bridges. And we, we crawled all over that thing and examined it. Uh, whatever. <laughs> yeah, honey. Uh, first audience. Between the two houses, we had heard at Grandma's house at dinner and lunch, we had heard the Korean War had started. We went back to his house, got about halfway through the grove, and we got to talk. We talked all the way, all the way. We were wondering if that war was going to last long enough so that we could get to go to it, too. You know, you didn't want to miss a war. Everybody else been in World War II, and we'd heard about that ever since we were born, so this Korean thing sounded like a deal that was our shot. Uh, ended up not being. The Vietnam one was, was for me. Bill Dick Ford. Uh, BB gun duel, or I'll be done. And the hammer uh, We had a BB gun duel. And the BB gun was supposed to be empty. So we sort of, we emptied them and I hadn't. And I, I don't know if I really knew that or not. But I didn't know he got shot. But we walked our 10 paces, turned and shot. His shot hot air. And mine shot him. <laughs> so I lost my baby gun. <laughs> All becomes a rusty in his, uh, his uh, The hammer story. We were out in front of the house one day, and the guys driving tractors were going up and down the road there at Grandma's, and we were in the shade of one of those big old trees. And we were throwing things up in the air and acting like we were kind of fake throwing them at the tractors. And they were 50 or 100 yards away. They knew better than that. But I threw a claw hammer up straight up in the air one time. <laughs> It came down right on the top of Rusty's head. <laughs> so it hurt. Well, he took me down and had me down with that hammer, just mattering a hornet at me. And my grandmother, Rose Gardner, those of you who knew her, who was just the next thing to it, if there was a, some of us other would be able to explain one too, but she's one of the angels on earth. Amen. She never did anything but <laughs> tend people and be sweet. And she'd come out of there, she's always telling us to play pretty. <laughs> so said, don't you be ugly <laughs> so she's out there telling Rusty to play pretty and not be ugly and he's about to kill me with that <laughs> and I'm saying Grandma I, I'm, I'm thinking we need tougher language than this <laughs> this is a special event here uh, the, other, the last thing I'll do and I, I do this I've realized it with my mother at, 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 her, at her funeral memorial service uh if you lived on the Owen side or that side of Arcadia, you crossed the river every time you went to town. And those of you who live there are going to have a little of this, even if you haven't thought about it. I'm kind of like Rusty. I really pondered things pretty deep like that. And he and I, again, talked about this to this day. When you cross that river and look south, there's a cypress tree, kind of about halfway out in the middle of the river bed, the major bed. And all our 70 some odd years of being friend, connected, we always would talk, you, you, we watch, you watch that cypress tree to where the water was that told you how everything else was. You know, you always, you knew that there was high water, low water, dry spell, whatever, you, you gauged all that by the river. And I didn't realize this till 10 or 15 years ago, but you know, if you lived out on the other side of town, you'd drive all the way from Lake Placid to Arcadia. You'd see the wet spots and the ponds, but that watching that river rise and, and go down and be dry and be full, you could all you always knew what was going on, and you knew what was going on everywhere else too, because you knew when the water was there at that certain point there, you knew in Bunker, Brownsville, Wachula, Fort Ogden, or somewhere, something else was going on. So we always we always watched that, and uh, and we talked about a lot of these same things numerous times and then there's there's a lot of little, there's other stories in between that uh, just have to be shared somewhere else but uh, <laughs> anyway, that's rusty rusty was a uh, everything you've said about him it's been said about him today he was a wonderful storyteller a history person and it's interesting 
many of the things you said here today, I'm all over. Yeah. You know, I, I can drive through Arcade and say, so-and-so lived there, so-and-so lived there, the other guy that got used to live there moved, and somebody else moved into that house, and then he died, and they moved. And I, I mean, you can go all the way back, and I test myself now doing that. I'll drive a different street just to be sure I can check myself. <laughs> Hot shot Mercer, Charlie Mercer. All, all that whole, uh, all that whole bunch of guys were all my. I guess I worshipped them all a little bit, and then, they, but they just really worked on me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you play that game where you'd shoot somebody and have to lay down and count to a hundred. Well, they just like standing behind the tree. I was laying down all the time, count. <laughs> they were always out playing, running around. Every time I got up, they. <laughs> 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 I guess Rusty would say, come on out, we got Dick to play with. <laughs> okay, that's my uh, my story. Rusty was a, a wonderful person and will be missed. And I, he's probably my last connection. If I know other, maybe Keith and a couple, two or three of y'all back there to say, who was so-and-so? The guy that drove the old ragged truck that did, you know, who was it? He said, that was Henry Tompkins, or that was so-and-so. I'm losing those people to ask. You know, who owned the place down the road for the other place, you know? And uh, so anyway, I, I, will, I will miss him forever, and I just got to look and see which this was. <coughs> Everybody in my family wore Brazistol hats. I'm not enough of a hat guy to know one way or another, but you know what? I got the brother to that in a hat box. It says Adam's Men's Store. I wanted to pay twenty dollars for it. <laughs> Five eggs, paper. Sit in a city house, so I can uh, appreciate it. Thank you for listening.